Ralph yeah. Lauren, yeah. Donna, Calvin, Mark, Michael, you know, like it is pretty yeah. much that. So for a new designer to have, that was my breakout moment. And right after that, you know, I started, had a lot of support from the uh, film industry, a lot of celebrities, a lot of actresses who started wearing it. Then my biggest get, I would say, was the first lady, for, former first lady, my first She's lady. She's still my first lady. My, my, I was about I mean, to say, yeah, yeah. my first lady, <laughs> uh, Michelle Obama, and who um, wore this dress of mine. And that completely, you know, like, these were the moments, pivotal moments. Then I was one of the Vogue CFDA Fashion Fund winners. So there are, like, a lot of moments. So yeah. I don't sit here... Um, you know, here and also generally thinking that I did this on my own. You know, I had a lot of people uh, who supported me, believed in me, believed in my story, believed that I had something to say and gave me an opportunity. Right. So you like to call yourself a storyteller, which I, I find really interesting because I think most designers just like to be like, oh, I'm this designer and I'm this and that. Why do you... Fab <laughs> fabulous. <I'm> fabulous. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Always the word fabulous. Yeah. Um, how do you weave so many intricate details into you know, this story that becomes a beautiful collection and, and has so many different intricate details? I think what really brings all of us together is we may have different kind of interests, different kind of love, is a shared interest in each other's story. I think what binds us together, especially in a divisive world we're living today, is our own stories. And I've always been curious about everyone else's journey, everyone else's story. Um, I myself, as I mentioned, I came from, I was you know, brought up by a single mother back home in Nepal where a patriarchy rules big time. It was unheard of. I came here to America without knowing anyone. And truly, like mine is an, um, an immigrant story, like an immigrant who came to America with an American dream, right? And what really, so I always look at the two collections. We do four collections, but the two main runway shows that we do, I look at it as our, my opportunity to tell a story um, of whether, you know, what the inspiration is. You know, for me, it's not just, not, not, not just about, um, you know, making a dress and that's it. You know, like it, it, there is, because behind the dress that is being, that let's say you're wearing, you know, and, uh, and um, there is, there are designers who work, mm, who work on it. There's an inspiration, there's a research. There are many immigrants who are sewers you know, who are seamstresses, factory workers, um, and you know, majority, and so that I think I have a responsibility to be able to represent them, right? And I'm intrigued by that. I'm, I am um, interested in sharing their story. So every time, every season, there's a different theme. One season, it was like Charles Dickens, The Great Expectations. Then after that was a Gloria Steinem's book, you know? Then, um, we had this Iraqi, this uh, photographer, like so. It it could be about anything else, but I just think this is a moment for me. To have millions of audiences, eye and views and interest at that particular moment, and I'm able to share that story. Yeah. So what are you? I think we, we always have this conversation of like things that need to change, but in your you know direct line of sight, what are you not seeing in fashion that you want to change? How so? I mean, who, uh, do we have all night long here? We do. I mean, we do. No, I'm, kidding. I'm kidding. The first and foremost thing is what I find really problematic with fashion is, though I'm part of that, is the complete lack of accountability, okay? Uh, the complete lack of representation and tokenizing of uh, the minorities. You know, whether you're a person of color, whether you know, you know, you're transgender, whether you're gay, whether you're, um, you know, any kind of minority. And I find it like, you know, um, this whole notion of like now, especially right now, what is, the intention is there, and I don't want to, you know, knock that down. The intention of making a change is there, but um, they're not willing to do the work. That's what I feel like. Say it again. Say you know, it again. Then, no, no, really. Like you know, I feel like you know. Sometimes you know, um, I remember um, when I did the. So I did a collaboration with Lane Bryant, you know, and one of the reasons why I wanted to do was I kept on looking, and I was part of the problem also, just so that you know. We kept on na um, representing this narrow idea of what beauty seems like. It was a. Size zero, blonde hair, blue eyed, white girl. 
I still love them. There's nothing wrong with that. But I wanted another kind of storytelling also. And I still remember, like, you know, it was a Victoria's Secret show and um, Day of, and, and all these girls who do my show, they also do that show. And I remember, like, you know, I was like texting them, congratulations, good luck tonight, da 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 da. And, and I was sitting there in, in a taxi going home and I was thinking to myself, my goodness, I've become part of the problem that I have all this audience, I have all this opportunity, I have this platform, and yet I'm still in perpetuating this idea. So that's what, and right at that time, the Victoria's Secret, uh, uh, sorry, Lane Bryant's big truck went by saying, I'm no angel. And I remember it was on West 4th Street and 6th Avenue, and I sat there, it was, it just hit me like, a Mack truck, like, and I was just like, whoa, okay, I need to, and I texted my team, I said, I need to have a meeting, and I said, I want to do a um, collaboration with Lane Brown because I want, I want to say something, and at that time, I still remember, after I did that collaboration, you know, and I, when I did the collaboration, I told Lane Bryant, I want it to be done in the most elevated way. You know, for the longest period of time, this girl has been treated as if she belongs in the, you know, the corner, that nobody else sees it, I said, she deserves pages of Vogue. She deserves to be shot by the best photographers and on a best model there. So we shot it on Ashley Graham with Innocent Venute and we did get the page of Vogue, you know? It was very important for me because I wanted, when I started the company, I said, I want to start a luxury brand with a soul. And the whole idea of the notion of the soul is that I'm able to see someone in front of me, let them know that they matter, they, that, that I, my actions validate their existence, you know? It was very important for me, but, the backlash that I got from that particular, at that time was, I still remember an art opening that I was hosting for my friend and this, this girl came up to me and said, uh, why are you making clothes for fat people? You know, and I looked at her and I said, the very reason that you had the gall, the balls to say that question is the reason why I wanted to do that, you know? So it's one of those things, it is, it is, and she works in fashion. Oh, I'm sure she You know, does. she works well, in fashion. She is size. I don't doubt you know, that. You know, there's no, I mean, you know, and, and this is one of the many cases. There was uh, right after the uh, Terry Richardson's, you know, like whole scandal came about and, you know, like sexual harassment and all that stuff. And I remember, like, you know, I spoke up about it on online and everything. And um, I immediately got a backlash from one of the major stylists. I'm not going to name her name. Uh, major stylists who, who texted me and said to me, you're a fucking fashion, sorry. You're a, you're a, I'm sorry. You're a fat, that, those, these were the words. I'll never forget it till I die. I feel these words. As she said, you're a fashion designer. Uh, why don't you just stick to making clothes? How does it even matter to you? Um, and I said to her, I said, I'm a human being. You know, I have sisters, nieces, nephews. And I too have been through similar kind of experience myself. So it becomes my responsibility. And I said, thanks for policing me, but it's not going to work. You know? Help. So so <laughs> these are these are the things. And these are these are the few things that happen. So what what I look at it is, you know, and the reason, continuous reasons why, like in fashion and fashion magazines or fashion industry, there's always this tokenism, there's always this mistakes that keeps on happening. Is it's simply because there's a the seat at the table hasn't changed. Behind the scenes, people haven't changed. When I, I, I was at a summit, like one of these conversations, and we were talking about plus size, and I said to these women, I said, if, and I'm saying it to all of you, if you want changes, if you want your people like you represented in a magazine, if you want any kind of change, you need, you need to look at the seat at the table. Who is behind it? Unless there is someone who looks like you, unless there's someone who represents you, change is not going to happen. They're going to do it. What, what is going to happen is it's going to be an issue or two, a photo shoot or, or like, you know, out of 12 issues, there'll be a two editorial where they're able to say, but look, we've done this. Do you know what I mean? It is till you demand it, that change. Mm -hmm. and, and you know, that's the conversation that I want to have. And that's the thing where fashion industry is completely lacking is also, I'm, I'm sorry, I'm not talking too much, but these are things that are no, very yeah. passionate, I mean, I'm very passionate about. The other thing is also, the first thing to change is acceptance and the ability to say, be vulnerable and say, I don't know. I don't know, help me. I always say, first of all, before even I say I help you, why don't you Google it? 
why don't you do your homework? Why don't you... In, um, I always say to my friends, you know, sometimes they'll send me, do you think this is okay? Do you think this is appropriation? I always text them, JFGI. I don't know if you know that. Just dash Google it, okay? <laughs> so I always do that. You know, so then, then after that, let's have a conversation. Because I think if anybody comes to you, if anybody comes to us and says, you know, I don't know about this, I, don't, I always ask, have you done your homework? Have you done any bit of research? Do you have, because if I say something to you, are you able to cont contribute with an equally important question, you know? And what I do want to start is a culture of like us telling them how to do it when they have to when they haven't even done their effort you know yeah. so it's that kind of conversation that i want to have and you know fashion has a long way to go there's no doubt i wish i could sit here and tell you guys oh it's changing it is moving in the right direction but if you look at the european houses you know yeah. i mean you know there's a I, don't, I mean i don't know if i should name the designer but you know if you guys google it you'll know she says Oh, you know, I don't believe in this in a plus size on a runway, you know, like I, I don't think it makes any difference in that kind. There was a, a prominent European designer who she said that about us, you know, in American America and American designers. My thing is the power. We can have this conversation. We, you can you guys can go feel inspired and, you know, yeah, this is what it should be. But the true thing that happens is the money that you spend. Who are you spending it on? You know, yes, all these, you know, European, American brands, including mine, might be cute and everything, but you really need to start thinking because my generation is, you know, forget about it, it's up to you guys now. The real change is it's you guys who are going to make it. It's you guys who are going to ask us, okay, are you able to step up? Are you able to do this for us? And that's what you should be able to, you know, question us and challenge us. Because the status quo, I'll tell you this much, in fashion, in fashion, in style, in anything creative world, in film, nothing is going to change till you guys ask for it. Because right now, the people at the at decision-making table or like, you know, the guardrails, like you know, I, I call them, it's the same. It's the same. They have been getting away of doing this for more than 30, 40 years. Yeah. Now it is up to you guys. That's what I'm telling you. So how you make that change is by the money you spend, whether it's a dollar, 50 cents, or $100 or $1,000. Spend it wisely. Spend it on people who you believe in. Because what we get reports, I'll tell you, is this. They keep on saying, you know, the millennials and the, the younger generations, they, they, they're passionate about it, but look at you know, Zara and H&M and all these big, they're still doing well. We get constantly told, a designer like me, all your political views, all your cultural views, all your inclusivity views, all these diversity views mean nothing at the end of the business, you know, when they look at the numbers. So, if you want real change, if you want those people who are holding the dollars, mm -hmm. right? to change, you have to make the change. And you have to stop buying or buy people, designer brands, things that matters to you, things that represents your values. Because fashion no longer is an isolated, fabulous stuff. Though I do love fabulous fashion, don't get me wrong, you know. But um, I think it is extremely important that you guys understand the power that you guys have. I mean, I think that there has been a few instances where in at least in the past year that we've seen people speaking up and things changing. I mean, I know you, some of you probably recognize the Gucci Dapper Dan situation and um, Dap is like the most amazing person and he, um, once he came on and with Gucci, they gave him the credit and that situation definitely worked out for the better, but I feel like that's the exception to the rule. It doesn't always happen that way. Um, and so, I, I did like even your um, your fall 2018 campaign was super diverse and it was all Asian cast and all Asian crew. What do you say to your peers to you know push them to set, push them to understand like how they should focus on representation every season? Because I do feel like we can preach this all day long, but I think it's also about us having conversations with our peers of like okay like here's how I do this, here's why you need to do this, and, and getting them on board. So. You know, the first thing, as I said earlier, the first thing about it is having a conversation is also creating an environment where people are okay saying, I don't know. And then you know, you, the conversation starts, right? 
So when I did that campaign with um, all Asian casts and you know behind the scenes as well, it was simply it was personal. A lot of these things, decisions that I've made are personal decisions um, that have affected a bigger change. Um, I I know what it feels like to turn the pages of a magazine, fashion magazines, and find no one that looks like you. I understand what it feels to be felt like you don't belong there. You feel less worthy, you know, that you don't occupy that space. I know how it feels. It takes a lot of healing, a lot of time to get to a place where you realize, you know, you're worth, you're worthy of being there as well. So what I wanted to do was when I had a platform, when I had an opportunity, I wanted to change that narrative. So, so that, you know, I have, as I said, I have nieces and nephews growing up. And besides that also, I wanted, you know, maybe that girl or a guy, um, in Nepal or in somewhere here in LA in the corner where you know who's always taunted or who doesn't feel like they belong in the mainstream you know idea of a beauty beauty can turn these pages or look at my campaign and feel like oh wait a second I am beautiful I am worthy you know I wanted to have that kind of conversation and this the thing to do with our peers is to I which I have it and you know I have my own group of WhatsApp um, conversation where I keep on sending we have this conversation but I think forums like this the more conversation we've had and really like you know bringing out different generation different ideas different conversation I think that's the only way the change is going to happen um, I think we've recently seen a lot of shows in luxury designers say really horrible just quite frankly horrible and disgusting things about you know they're not willing to think that certain body types are beautiful or they're not willing to change yeah. their stance on things um i mean what what do you feel like as a creative and somebody who has this platform like what do you then think about that and do with that because i do feel like um just as someone in the industry I see so many people making excuses, and it's like I refuse to support someone who feels a certain type of way about policing someone's body or telling them how they should look or anything like that. But I mean, as a designer, there's so many people in the industry who just flat out say, you know, I don't think clothes look beautiful on this type of body type, or I'm not ever going to put somebody like this in a campaign, or I tried that once and it didn't sell, so I'm not going to do that again. So, w what do you feel when that kind of situation happens? Um. When I hear it, when I read it, when I, um, I just want to, I honestly, this is my reaction is always, I just want to sit with them one-on-one -on -one and really show them like it is possible. It infuriates me, to be completely honest. I get really um, in, we're almost to 2019 now. This is 2018 and we're still having that conversation, you know? And what I, what I find um, problematic here is um, the acceptance from the rest of the fashion industry. When those statements by these leaders of our industry, whether it's designers, whether it's editors, whether it's buyers, or whoever is making it, that they're allowed to, you know? And, and our complicity of our industry is the biggest issue here, you know? And the only change that has happened, I would say, is it started for us in, with Teen Vogue. I'm not even kidding. Right after, ooh, ooh. No, no, right after the election, you know? And the... Uh, I think it was Lauren Duca's article about you know, Trump is gaslighting America. That article changed the immediately changed the course of how fashion is, at least for me, that I was like, thank God, like we're in it. I mean, I'm not thanking God that we're in the current, you know, um, government, you know, but the thing is, thank God there is an opportunity now we can, we're able to talk about this. I think it is, it, I find it horrific that, you know, for instance, so when we are casting and everything uh, for our show, so I told my casting directors, you know, like, um, all right, I want this kind of representations of models, you know, whether it's um, trans model, whether it's models of color, minorities and everything. And they would bring, and I use like, let's say 40 models, they'll be like, okay, three black models, three Asians, you know, this and then. And I was like, okay, no, you know, I said, can I get more of these? And I would like, you know, explain it to them, come back again, there'll be one more edition. So I had to turn around and tell them, I said, listen, I had to sit everyone down. I said, for the longest period of time, us minorities have felt tokenized. Yeah, if you okay. see two people in a show, you're like, okay, yeah. great. Like so, and I said to them, I said, reverse it, okay? I want you to feel that from a white person, as a white person, feel it, what it feels like to be tokenized and to feel like marginalized. 
I want you to feel that way and understand where I'm coming from. It was not, not with anger. It was just like you know, having this conversation. And they got it. They got it. And, and I realized that then, and also I've realized it a long time back, I have to, within what I do, I can be in control of it. Like, you know, I am, I'm in the driver's seat. You know, I'm always the kind of person, even with my design team, I always tell them, all the good ideas don't come from me. I have a great design team. Sometimes I have the brilliant ideas. Sometimes they tell me, oh, it's horrible, you know? So I'm willing to collaborate that way. That goes to everything that we do. Designing, styling, casting, everything. My, my biggest issue, as I said, keep on, um, you know, like, what gives me hope is when I see someone like you at the, you know, being the editor-in-chief of Teen Vogue, which is really the change, you know, the change agents are them and you. Just to see that kind of representation is what excites me, you know, because I know, I know the representation is going to be done the right way. I know it's not going to be, oh, let's just, you know, filling the quotas. It's no longer going to be about that. So, yeah, I'm excited about the future. Thank you. Yeah. I'll move it to questions if, if anybody, because I won't talk too much. Do you guys want to go to the mic? Hi. Hello. Hi. Hi. This question is for both of you. I know uh, you're, you're very well known about fashion, but... You're cold. <laughs> um, <laughs> Zara, H&M, Urban Outfitters, they've all done some really reprehensible things, put out some fashions that are so offensive. And my question is, who's making those decisions? Are they that blind that they will put something out there in the market? And how do we change it? I mean, I think I, I can... Do you want to answer this first? I think the the funny thing is, a lot of times, um, the, I've been in so many shoots and so many meetings where it's something has gone through literally 30 people, and I'm the first person to be like, that's stupid. Why would you ever do that? Like, that's a horrible idea. Like, that's so offensive. And I do, like like he was saying, I think it's a lot of times there just aren't the right people in the room. Because literally every single time that's happened, I could have... And every time I've said, like, if somebody would have asked me, I would have said, like, hey, don't put a monkey sweatshirt on a little black boy. Like, come on. Like, but I think a lot of times it's, it's really honestly not the right people in the room. It's not, it's, it's like everyone hiring their friends and their friends' friends and not really actually saying, like, you know what, we need somebody that has a different opinion here. Um, and unfortunately, like, nepotism is real in fashion, so people just continue to perpetuate that. And it's, it's the same question, you know, uh, uh, it's a seat at the table. And the seat at the table in a corporate scenario, that doesn't change unless your own dinner table has changed. I always say that. If your personal dinner table looks like a certain way, how are you to expect, how are you to learn from anyone else's experience, anyone who comes from a different background? How are you to change that, you know? So I think, um, as I said, like, what is the best... Uh, as offensive as that is, um, you know, what they do, what is really exciting is people calling it out and, you know, um, and the real change being, ha being made. So, yeah. Thank you. Hi, my name is Lena. Um, Mr. Gurung, um, I really like the point that you made about, like, spending your dollars um, where it matters and with responsible companies as a long-term goal. What would you recommend as a short-term goal to hold um, companies accountable um, for their non-sustainable choices, and, and how can we reassure that um, the companies that are uh, being sustainable, they get rewarded um, with better behavior um, for the short term? I mean, the sh short term immediately, I would say, is like, you know, besides the buying power, like what, you know, like what you guys have is understanding the power you guys have of, even if it's one voice, right? And I think also what I would like to suggest to all of you sitting here today is we're living in this world where we are condemning culture, right? And I think when you attack someone, when there's a real issue to be attacked, that's great. But you know, when, it's, when it becomes a consistent ha habitual thing, even those people, they're not going to listen, right? And immediately. So I think the language that we use, the approach, delivery, what we do, how we do, needs to be, I think, thought about. But I would say the immediate thing that you can do is literally gather people together, people like-minded people, and um, you know, like question them 
and challenge them, challenge the authority, challenge their decisions. You know, as a brand for me, just so that you know, like majority, more than 90% of the clothes are made in America. It's simply because I made the decision because A, I wanted to give back to this country that, you know, gave me an opportunity. B, I wanted to make sure that the factories that are within the vicinity of my office, uh, the carbon footprint wasn't that much. The mills that we use, you know, um, from like whether it's from Europe or wherever it is, uh, mainly from Europe, are practicing the right kind, uh, you know, right kind of practices for like with laborers and everything. And the knits that we make back home in Nepal, we not only give back to, um, you know, like majority of the uh, workers are women, more than 50 percent, and. I also have a foundation back home in Nepal that I started with educating girls. I started from 12 to 300. And so we do all the steps that we give back. So I think the immediate thing for you guys today is like kind of do your homework about what the brand is, you know, um, who, what the brand represents. And brands like H&M or like, let's say, Zara and everything, you know, H&M is making those efforts about sustainability and, you know, like they are making that effort. Also understand, challenge them for sure, there's no doubt about it. But also, don't forget the effort and, and question the, I would say, the efforts that they're making also, but also appreciate the efforts that they're making, that I would say. Quick. Does that does it make sense? Yes, it yeah, does. Okay. Thank you very much. Oh, you're welcome. Hi, um, my name is Roman Seip, and I am an emerging designer. Um, and I sort of resonate with your idea of storytelling through your brand and things like that. So I came up with the concept of men's lingerie, even though it's not a new concept, four years ago. And it's been doing really well, and I'm like so blessed to like- What is it fun. called? It's called Menagerie. Okay. Menagerie Intimates and Formal okay. Nightwear. Okay, all right. <laughs> oh, okay. I like that. Designed right. exclusively for men. Um, okay. And when I say men, I mean every man that's plus size, thin, Got it. Yeah. trans, all over the board. And, but, and, 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 and possibly women who like it and of course women who like it yeah. um, but women have a lot right now when it comes to lingerie <laughs> yeah. and I love it as well um, do but, they really um, just tomorrow <laughs> is it tomorrow second Victoria's Secret fashion show yeah yeah that's what um, I'm saying that's why I'm asking that's why I'm yeah, asking um, that's why I'm asking do they really have a choice so yeah. with, right with that um, being said I have been asked recently a lot about like who I'm designing for, what man, what this, and I always sort of curve the question. I say, well, I sort of focusing on the wedding, you know, um, like wedding industry. Um, but realistically, I'm not. I, I want to say I, I'm supporting every man, but they're like, well, you only have like a white fit model on your website, or you have one black model, or this or that. I'm wondering if when you started doing plus size um, pieces, uh, without sort of like changing the fit or the style to just sort of be for a specific person. Was it, and I know you used Ashley Graham and she's gorgeous and beautiful, but was it hard for you to get other plus size women to understand that they can wear these certain things without feeling uncomfortable? Um, and then my second part is uh, I attended the toxic masculinity sort of like thing earlier. And that's another problem that I come when trying to find my, my problem is finding models that are comfortable in my, things. Okay. Um, I'll model it. There are... <laughs> there, there, you, are there you go. You're all... I've been on the hunt for an African-American model because I am obviously an African-American male and I want to you know, get that out there. Um, but there are guys that want to but won't, just like there are plus-size men who want to wear my things but won't. Um, and I think they all look beautiful and, and, I, and I am like firm in saying it's for every man, gay, straight, yeah. trans, like uh, but yeah, it, was it hard to sort of convince people that don't necessarily have the shape of Ashley Graham or um, like that, that they can too wear these things without having to like change it to fit their body or their life? Okay. So it was my first collection, the mm -hmm. same dress that was on the cover of Women's Wear Daily. Uh, I got an opportunity to, I got, I got, I was asked to make a dress for Oprah Winfrey, mm -hmm. who's been my biggest hero, you know, and um, and she she's obviously not uh, like in a size zero, like in on running well, on the runway. Mm -hmm. But for me, it didn't matter. I didn't even think about her size, right? For me, it's the essence of who she is that yeah. is really empowering and exciting. I've had several, so I never. From the beginning in itself, I never thought like, you know, oh, you know, I'm doing anything radical. However, um, and we, we also have offered 
different sizes within our brand, like you know, from our sizes goes up to t size 20 to 24. You know, we've always offered, but the fashion system is so wrong that they don't. Sometimes the retailers they don't buy. There's only one company now called Eleven Honor A that carries plus size. The change is happening very slowly, right? So going back to your question about how do you convince women um, that they don't look like Ashley Graham, you know, the thing is, idea. Uh, Ashley Graham happens to be a model, mm -hmm. you know, but she, she happens to be a curvy model, a model, but also beyond that, she is a force of nature, mm -hmm. right? So that's why I, I'm attracted to her, and that's why I use her for my show. But uh, there are others, Marquita, there is Candice, there's Candice yeah. in our thing. So we, what we do is, you can't possibly convince each and every woman out there, or each and every man there, but what you do is telling them is, hey, this is the world that my world is that you two are welcome. Mm -hmm. You are no longer, you need to feel like, you know, you don't belong. You know, you're part of our world. And what I had to do was like, you know, um, just change the technical aspect of like, you know, what the clothes look like, how it fit and everything. But it worked, you know, like we have a great private client business, women of different shapes and sizes come. And, you know, for me, let's face it, you know, um, size 16, it, size, Yes, I think size 12 or size 14 is the average size of America. Mm -hmm. Okay, more than 50%. Yeah. And the reason we're even having this conversation is it's our industry that have been at the forefront of this real problem. Mm -hmm. You know, and going back to, I'll answer one more thing about it. Maybe I don't know if it answers your question or not, but when I was casting for my, always casting for my runway show and everything, um, I have to keep on asking agents, model agents, okay, we need more plus size models. And then they'll send me any plus size girl. And I always feel like I am my one runway, I'm, it is Gigi, Bella, Taylor Hill, yeah. Joan Smalls, and everything of that caliber. I want plus size models of that caliber. Mm -hmm. When I say of that caliber, confidence, the ability to be walk. I don't want to, and, and I said, I just don't want to use, because, well, I need to fill in the plus size quota. I'm just going to use anyone. I don't yeah. want to do that. Mm -hmm. I want that girl. So Ashley, Candice, Marquita, when they walk my runway show, they feel equally empowered. And guess what? Gigi and Bella and all these other models also feel equally empowered. They're like, my God, it feels so good to be part of your show. That's why I keep on hearing it, you know? Everyone cries at his shows, yeah. literally. <laughs> everyone is. is always crying and so happy. Like it's, It is, because, you know, the thing is, I... I like, I don't know, I, we, you know, there's a, it was a, it started in a meeting in an office, I said stronger in color, that's what I kept on mm -hmm. saying, you know, like in a, literally my collections are very colorful. I also believe in a world that is colorful, yeah. you know, and um, so all you need to keep on doing is, in, I think it becomes your responsibility, yes, there might, people might say, you know, there are white models there, it becomes that, because for the longest period of time, the beauty, definition of beauty and everything has been by, um, white folks yeah you know okay thank you yeah okay <laughs> thank you so much yeah. it was so it was so amazing to talk to you i hope you guys enjoyed um thank you his, thank you you really are the most incredible i'm so so grateful oh, um i think much. now we're gonna start our closing portion and ella is gonna come up all right okay thank you guys all right <laughs> yeah. we'll, we'll do it. Thanks.